Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. A production of South Carolina ETV and ACSN. This spring, about two million students earn college degrees of one sort or another. The music is traditional, the scene familiar, but college itself has changed in the classroom and out. Some part-time students take a dozen years or more to finish, and college costs more, as much as $100,000 for four years meaning more borrowing. Today's college graduates are, as the song goes, another day older and deeper in debt, $10,000 on the average. College has changed, for better and for worse, in ways both big and small. I'm John Merrow. Welcome to Learning Matters. Learning Matters is made possible by grants from the people of Toyota, who believe that striving for excellence is not just a goal, but a way of life. Learning Matters is also made possible by grants from the Pew Charitable Trusts, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Our first change may be the biggest of all. Who is going to college? Today's students, at least 13 million of them, are a diverse lot. We have two completely different populations of college students, and they tend to segregate themselves into different kinds of institutions. We have the full-time uh, undergraduate coming to college for the first time, and most of those, 95% of those, are right out of high school. If you ask the question this way, uh, what proportion of the students are full-time uh, and in residence? Uh, that figure is, meaning in college housing, that figure is something like 12 percent. The other population is the adult part-time student, uh, many of whom have had some college before but for one reason or another didn't finish, dropped out, and are coming back. Uh, many of them are part-timers, practically all of them are commuters, and they tend to go to public institutions um, and very heavily to community colleges, some state colleges. Diversity is the name of the game in American higher education. In all, we have 3,500 colleges and universities, from giant research universities to community colleges, from four-year residential colleges to urban commuter colleges that don't have campuses. Because of population changes, there's plenty of classroom and dormitory space here in these Midwestern states. In hard economic times, people have moved out looking for jobs. On the other hand, these high growth states are running out of room. Too many students, not enough classrooms, dormitories, teachers, or money. They're capping enrollments. And in where they haven't capped enrollments, you find students who can't get the courses they need to graduate, uh, can't they just can't find the courses because they're either over enrolled or they're not available. Most colleges and universities accept virtually every high school graduate who applies. But getting into one of the 250 highly competitive colleges, that's another story. Middlebury College in Vermont, for example, receives about 3,400 applications every year for only 1,000 openings. Inside each application folder are high school grades, SAT or ACT scores, letters of recommendation, and a brief essay. However, my father showed me the difference between the easy way and the right way. Each folder is read and graded by three different readers. At the end of the process comes the review and the vote by the committee. It's, it's, I think I that's in a reject. I think it's in a reject. I think it's in a reject. I wonder what they're teaching them, um, because that... Um, I mean, I'll erase this reject if you'd like me to. I think we have consensus refusal. Yeah. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most of the competitive colleges have not changed their admissions process. They still rely on lots of paper to make decisions about candidates they probably have not seen face to face. But a few colleges are discarding the SAT and ACT requirement and looking instead at portfolios of student work. Correspondent Lee Hochberg reports from Portland, Oregon. Okay, well, I think the, uh, the issue is also fairly simple on this one. 
um, you can tell that her her board scores are low. They're very low uh, uh, when considering Lewis and Clark's standards and so forth. These college admissions officers have come upon a red flag in the application of 18-year-old Rachel Record, a girl with sterling high school grades. She has a disappointing SAT score of 850. In summary, that's the only thing that's wrong with her. Uh, she's got a 3.5 plus GPA as a, as a The mediocre her board school. score could keep the girl from getting into some schools, but it might not keep her out of Lewis and Clark, a selective private college in Portland, Oregon. I wonder why she gave us the SATs. I know. For three years, the school has offered students the option to withhold their SAT or ACT scores and instead submit portfolios highlighting their academic background. Portfolios include transcripts and teacher recommendations and might include videotapes of musical performances. She has been involved in other state competitions and she also plays the cello and the clarinet. Anything that tells more about their academic promise than the typical application or college board test might. There's an attempt to take four years of a high school experience and get it on a piece of paper and to maybe supplement that with three hours of a test on a Saturday morning and get that down to a number. And I don't know anybody that's put that much effort into four years of high school that they feel that accurately tells what they've done. Lewis and Clark Dean of Admissions, Mike Sexton, says the 72 students who've come through Lewis and Clark's portfolio path have shown him something extra. Tanya Elia, for example, now a Lewis and Clark sophomore majoring in political science and music, had a hole in her application when she applied two years ago. She had just returned from a year in South Africa as a Rotary Exchange student. She had no grades from that year and no SATs. Fresh on her mind, though, were memories of being the first white student ever seen in a rural South African town. Those memories, recorded in her journal, became her portfolio. It really made me get things in a different perspective than I had never, ever understood before. I'd never been so scared of just being different and being a minority. It was one of these pass around, and in the admissions office, if you get something like that, it's like, you got to read this, you got to see this. Or, uh, and I think we all appreciate in a student that um, they're a certain degree of a risk taker. Sexton says portfolio students have earned better GPAs at Lewis and Clark than traditional students. Nonetheless, the admission staff gruffly rejects one-third of portfolio applicants who may see the path as a way around Lewis and Clark's tough admission standards. Her portfolio consists of uh, no writing samples, but uh, approximately 10 photographs of her artwork which are quite interesting, actually, all of different mediums and so forth from her art classes. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to look, but she spelled fashion wrong on she every single <laughs> photograph. And she didn't take a lot of time to assemble it. If she wanted, wanted to impress us with her, uh, I guess, other talents, it seemed to me that she would have paid a little bit more attention to, mm -hmm. to putting those works together. Mm -hmm. Let's cut our losses. For Rachel Record, the Oregon girl with the disappointing SATs but the fine grades from South Eugene's International High School, the decision to admit or reject is a little tougher. It's amazing with her writing ability, her low SAT and her T-suite. Her verbal is lowest. And her T-suite is really quite low as well. I didn't like them because I know that they didn't show who I was. I know that they didn't represent my true knowledge in math and in language and what they needed to know about me as a person. So what's in the portfolio? Then? Some poems and then two very large research papers along with another paper. Oh, wow. and, and generally speaking, you can tell she put some serious time into them and they're, they're very good. She communicates fairly clearly. It's just it's not very sophisticated. Writing the words are very simple. I would hope that they would learn that I am a caring person who cares about issues in other parts of the world who someone who is able to look at all sides of the issue because there are a lot of different points that you need to perspectives that you need to take into consideration you can't just say well we need to end hunger and here's how we're going to do it and this was april of her junior year and heaven only knows this would have scared the socks off me in april of my junior year i say thumbs up thumbs up 
Okay. Yeah. I'm the school's critics, Sexton calls them traditionalists, say Lewis and Clark is courting trouble by devaluing the venerable SAT. The college board, which oversees the SAT, says for the 1,600 schools that use it, it's still the best predictor of how students will perform their freshman year. But portfolio students like freshman Victor Morton say they'll do even better work at Lewis and Clark because the school overlooked his modest SAT and made him feel valued. Probably the most important thing was that I'm not just another number, I'm an individual that you know, may or may not be geared to taking tests, but as an individual who has thoughts and dreams and can display them in writing just as well as the next person, and numbers may not prove as much. I think that it's silly to base people's potential on numbers, as I said before. I think it's really important to look at who they are and um, what's important to them and what they're are interested in doing. Claire Spurlock Cohen's interest in AIDS prevention and education came through in her portfolio. Despite mediocre boards, Lewis and Clark admitted her, and today she's leading discussions in classes on AIDS policy. I mean, you, they, you don't need to quarantine. And there, I mean, with Noah's question, what can social scientists do to help? I mean, it's the education. It's educating people about modes of transmission and safety and safer sex. And I found my passion. And it's something that's really important to me and through the portfolio process I was able to convey that. Other schools are following the Lewis and Clark example. More than 100 colleges have abandoned the SAT and in Oregon all public school students are now assembling portfolios to aid in assessment. Sexton warns that integrating them into large schools will be difficult. I can't see a state university that gets or even a large or a very selective, hyper-selective private institution that gets 20,000 applications to have the personnel to go through them. Like that. Okay, now push down on it. Up here, push down. In high school, you know, I uh, dropped out, had a little bit of trouble with the law, spent a little bit of time in JDH, was doing a lot of drinking, that kind of stuff, wasn't living at home, was a runaway. Um, didn't mean I was stupid didn't mean I wasn't a hard worker. For applicants like Steve Enghaus, it's fortunate that Lewis and Clark takes the time to dig deeper than transcripts. And keep in mind, this fellow in high school, let me get to his high school transcript. F, U, F, Z, D, W. Half of those grades you don't even recognize the grades. <laughs> and I was very impressed with the, the extent to which he has resolved that. He went through drug rehabilitation. Well, I think the first paragraph is um, shows some maturity and just, I don't know who I am, and her name is Heather Ashley Mills and she's two and a half years old. She runs around in circles, the excitement and, and anticipation too great for her to hold inside. Her pure and honest display of happiness is truly a beautiful sight. He's a good candidate for portfolio because this really shows his ability and his It really around. does show his ability. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. A huge accomplishment, a goal, a goal reached. I've grown up a lot, and then the portfolio path gave me a chance to prove that. Lewis and Clark predicts more students will opt to use portfolios to show things about themselves that standardized tests might overlook. Now let's talk about curriculum. In a way, the courses that college freshmen take haven't changed. They're still high school classes. 30% of freshmen begin college taking remedial classes, basic skills in math, reading, and writing material they were supposed to have learned in high school. At four-year colleges in New Jersey, where we went to report this story, four of every ten freshmen begin by taking high school courses. Here at Uppsala, a private liberal arts college, two-thirds of the freshmen have to take at least one catch-up course. Basic skills have been part of this college's mission since Del Erisman started the program in 1978. One reason for that was that I was teaching students in subject matter courses and realized that I was teaching basic skills. I was teaching them reading and writing on a very basic level rather than the uh, subject matter. I remember the subject matter was housing in America. We used Jane Jacobs' book, The Decline and Fall of Great American Cities, and he couldn't read it. Today, more students needing more remediation? Exactly. Many more students needing remediation 
and the remediation that many of them need is much deeper. I used to ask for 20-page papers from English majors. Now I'm happy to get four good pages from uh, upper-class English majors, and they'll complain about that sometimes. All right, I'll show this one, okay? What do we have in this picture? We have a clean sock and a dirty sock. So once again, what is this ad representing? In the basic communication skills class we visited, students were learning to recognize patterns in writing, cause and effect, sequential order, compare and contrast. It doesn't bother you being on a college faculty teaching a high school course? Not really, because I use college text materials, and I try to keep the level of the material and the discussions that ensue after we've done articles from Newsweek and Time magazine on a college level. Why are you in this class? Why remedial English? I didn't mean sure in high school. I let it, I just walked on by. You just walked on by. I mean, I had we had a right my senior year, and it was all introduced to me, but I just didn't grasp it. I didn't. I'm paying the price now. And I didn't pay attention, and really, I didn't. I didn't wasn't paying attention. I was doing something else in the classroom. Typical. You know. The last pattern that we're going to review is the cause and effect pattern. It's the description of the reasons that things occur and or their results. In your heart of hearts, who is responsible for the fact that so many students arrive in college unprepared? You can blame society, you can blame television, you can blame video, you can blame MTV, you can blame their high school English teachers, you can blame them. You can blame their families, well, well, but that's not really where, that's not a good attitude to have. Kids don't read anymore, and I'm not talking about reading in school. I'm talking about reading as part of life. Recreational reading, casual reading. Reading is a way of getting information, getting knowledge about the world. Just reading, it just doesn't happen. Do you blame the students? Of course not. How can you blame the kids? Yes, I get angry at them. Okay. There is a way in which an immediate confrontation with them, I get irritated. But reflectively, as we are now, no, you can't blame the kids. Rutgers University is New Jersey's best public university. Here, 20% of the freshman class require catch-up work in math and algebra, and at least 10% are placed in basic skills English yeah. courses. Um, absolutely. The uh, plural noun. What I see is that students come from high school. Many of these students are able to write, but they're not able to do the kind of college level reading and writing that they'll need. So everybody needs this kind of a bridge into the university. While some students in this English 100 course were born elsewhere, the majority of seats in Rutgers basic skills classrooms are filled by American students. Remedial courses are required, but do not count toward graduation. When I was in high school, uh, this this was never stressed. This and, and being was, strong reading, this this type of um, uh, approach. Uh, it was everything was just more on the. It was more super superficial. My high school, you know, very crowded, and I don't know if the teachers were capable of this. You know, a lot of papers I wrote were strictly summary, and strong reading is really new to me. Then we'll move into the next parts of that process in a few minutes following. Any questions about that? I just think of this course kind of like, you know, a brush up course improvement because it's really for my own good. Going into 101 this semester will probably have gotten me lower grades, I think, looking at papers, you know, com comments from my teacher. I just think this is an extra backup class to ensure, you know, better future grades. The director of Rutgers Writing Program says that colleges ought to be proud of their ability to provide the instruction students need. You know, my father went to a college uh, near Lake Champlain. It's now known as the State University of New York at Plattsburgh. But it was created for GIs coming back who were able to go to college on the GI Bill. Now, these people had just won World War II. They, come, they came back as conquering heroes, and they weren't told well, you're remedial, we're going to let you take some courses, but we're not going to give you credits for three years. What they said was, this way, 
and they introduce them to a, a new kind of university. The hidden truth is that we have always had something like developmental education. We have always been trying to deal with the students we had in a constructive way. Uh, but why is it a hidden truth? Why aren't we proud of that fact? Well, who designs the college curriculum? The faculty members, who are they? They're people who did well in school, who got PhDs, uh, and so their programs are understandably designed for people like them. The need for remediation will continue to increase, according to Alexander Aston, professor of higher education at UCLA. Over 27 years, Aston has surveyed millions of college students as part of an ongoing study. According to Aston's studies, the number of high school seniors who expect to take remedial courses in college has doubled from 22% in 1971 to 43% in 1990. The issue is whether we're just selecting the cream of the crop and giving them a degree or whether we're trying to educate people. And if we're trying to educate people, then it means we've got to change the way we approach these students who are not like us. We have a culture of indifference to students. I, I think that has happened in the United States. And so it's so convenient to say, well, they just don't know anything. These students don't know anything. What the person is really saying is, I only want to teach people who don't need to be taught. Pitch of a car. And um, I think it belongs on the simple listing patterns. Because Why? Because well, wait a minute. Remedial courses are a good thing. They're important. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're the most important thing we do in higher education. I mean, I look at this thing not from the point of view of my college, but from the point of view of our country and our society. You know, if, if these people don't acquire enough skills to become productive citizens and they're going to become a burden on the society in some form or another and who wants that? Let's argue this. You don't belong here. This is remedial stuff. You should have gotten this in high school so you shouldn't be in college. If you have a car and you got in a car accident, is it fair just because you wrecked one car you shouldn't have a car at all for the rest of your life? Is that a fair, is that fair to you? I've gotten a lot um during a writing session, during a writing session, because first, when I write a paper, I want to think about a thesis statement. I want to think about a conclusion. I would just go in and write my paper, and I'll just end it. But now in this class, I learned to uh, how to write a thesis statement. What is a thesis statement? The body of my paper and the conclusion. I'm, I'm 20 now, and I'm a freshman in college, so that's my fault. But I'm, I'm in a basic skills English, and I'm trying to get on my feet and get going and do what I want to do. What's happening at Uppsala and Rutgers is pretty much the norm, so don't be too tough on them. In fact, give them credit for opening their doors. Many colleges simply refuse to talk to us about remedial education. What other courses do college students take today? Well, some of them occasionally look for the easy ones. Uh, social ethics, definitely. Maybe acting. The one in the music department, it's called clapping for credit. Something like sociology or anthropology or something like that. How about the gym classes? Clapping for credit. There is this one course in the religion department um, called social ethics. Chemistry 131. Psych 1 is definitely an easy class and I think math 3 is pretty easy also. The names may change. Cake classes, guts, snaps, blow-offs, but the reality has not. Every college has one or two easy A courses. But are there more today? Too many? One Harvard professor says yesterday's C has become today's A, particularly in the humanities. I failed students, and I failed a few students uh, last semester. And I got a call. The, the Harvard safety net sort of goes out and grabs you if you're, a, if you're a teacher and you fail someone. And I got a call from some student's advisor. And I was asked, you know, why did you fail so-and-so? Because I spoke to him, and, and uh, he didn't know why he had failed. He thought he'd done perfectly well in your course. And I said, well, he, he didn't come to class. He wrote lousy papers, and he did terribly on the exam. I mean, <laughs> what was he expecting me to use as criteria? Since his essay in the Chronicle of Higher Education drew attention to grade inflation, Cole has received dozens of supportive letters from college faculty all around the country. One said... Grade inflation is the worst kept secret in academia. Another, Harvard has been part of a nationwide drift toward grade inflation. And a warning, I hope you don't receive too many brickbats for writing the truth. Why are grades going up? Cole, who's won 15 teaching awards from Harvard, says it's because the quality of instruction is going down. 
if you're going to go through a term paper really, really carefully and find everything that's good about it and everything that's bad about it and mark it up and so forth, then you can give it a C if you don't like it or a D or an F. On the other hand, if you want to just go through it in five minutes, you've got to give it an A. If you're going to hand back a paper with no comments, you can't just, you can't just put a D with no comments. And so therefore, it's much easier to be an easy grader than it is to be a hard grader. It's dangerous for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it breeds a certain contempt. If you go into a class and you know nothing about it, you take a literature class and you know nothing about literature, you go in there, you get an A with hardly working at all, you're going to have contempt for literature, contempt for your teacher, and even to some degree contempt for the humanities in general, contempt for the university in general. We don't have as good evidence about whether college grading is easier than it used to be. It's mostly anecdotal evidence, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that it's easier. Aston says grade inflation is a symptom of a larger problem. In general, the undergraduate education at public universities is, is mediocre at best. Mediocre? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty harsh. There's not much contact with faculty. The students very often drop out, transfer. So even though our big major universities get the cream of the crop in many states of, of the high school graduates, they really don't do as good a job with these students as they could. Universities, in my opinion, have lost sight of their goals. If you go and ask a university president, uh, how is your university doing? The person will say, well, our endowment is way up. Um, we've just stolen this, this professor from this other university and he won a Nobel Prize. Or we just got this professor and she won a Pulitzer Prize winning book. They'll talk very little about the quality edu of the education that the university is giving to the students. Alexander Aston and William Cole agree on a solution. More attention must be paid to students. Scholars and administrators are always talking now about the goals of the 20th century university, the goals of the international university, the goals of the modern university. Universities have one real goal, and that is teaching. And if they fall short of that, then all the other goals which they may be accomplishing don't really matter very much, it seems to me. The students are pretty good judges of what's happening to them. And I think they put up with a lot of what goes on, let's say, in some of our big research universities, namely the neglect of undergraduates or the indifference toward undergraduates, uh, because uh, they want the union card. And they say, well, you know, I can have a degree from prestige university number two, and therefore... I'll put up with this. Sounds to me as if you think students get the short end of the stick. Well, in certain respects, they do. Just who is doing the teaching on campus today has changed dramatically. Colleges are saying goodbye, Mr. Chips, and replacing him with part-time faculty, men and women who may spend as much time driving from campus to campus as they do in the classroom. In the lingo, they're called freeway flyers. Correspondent Jeff Kay reports from Los Angeles. It's 8 a.m. in Los Angeles, and Lou Versace is ready to hit the road again. Versace is an itinerant professor who teaches community college English classes more or less on the fly. Versace has a full-time schedule, but unlike his tenured colleagues who spend their time on one campus, Versace commutes to three L.A. area colleges. His home is in Culver City. From there, it's a short hop to West L.A. College, where he teaches Tuesdays and Thursdays. But then there are his other assignments. Santa Monica College, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And Pasadena Community College, Tuesday and Thursday nights. Versace spends 15 hours a week teaching. That's a full-time load. But five hours a week is behind the wheel. He's known in the business as a freeway flyer. Basically, I come, I teach my class, and I leave. In other words, I don't have an office. I work out of the back of my car. Versace's first stop is West Los Angeles College. It's one of the nine campuses in the huge L.A. Community College District, where 25% of the courses are taught by part-time teachers. He is supposed to go to the store. The example means he expected to go to the store. So suppose Versace seems to have a good rapport with his students, but he feels they're being shortchanged by traveling instructors who are paid only for the hours they spend in the classroom. I have no office hours. I'm just unavailable to students. And if that's important to a student, then he's missing out. Many of the students so in Versace's remedial English class agree. They say they could use some extra help outside class. Some of us are returning students from, you know, from 
like five, six years ago, and, and some are foreigners. And I guess we kind of, you know, a lot of us have forgotten, you know, a lot of the basic concepts of English. And, you know, it's, you know that's, I think that's why the office hours would be useful. Mm -hmm. and, and what would you do if he had an office? Come and ask him for help. Because that's what I used to do in my high school. I used to go to my other teachers to get some help from them. Versace has to teach at different schools because colleges limit the number of classes part-timers can teach. That way, they avoid paying costly benefits. Traveling allows him to teach five courses, a workload equal to a full-time instructor. But his equal work does not provide him equal pay. He earns about $25,000 a year. That compares to a tenured professor's $45,000 a year salary. I'm getting paid half as much. If you figure it out on an hourly basis, a full-time teacher at junior college uh, gets paid twice as much per hour as part-timers, which is why there's so many more part-timers than uh, full-timers. Activists Dan Nussbaum and Russell Lewis have long campaigned for increased benefits for part-timers. You have part-time instructors who are doing basically the same job as the full-time instructors do. Uh, we have to prepare our lessons, we have to develop our curriculum, we have to correct the papers of students and uh, we don't get paid for that work. And, of course, we get no medical benefits at all, which is a considerable part of the package that full-timers get. The L.A. College District is run by an elected board of trustees and an appointed chancellor. Recently, Nussbaum and Lewis took the grievances of part-timers to a public board meeting. What this is here is a presentation of one English teacher's paperwork for one English class for one week. As a part-time instructor, I'm not compensated to do this labor. And labor it is, my friends. I ask you, I beseech you, how many more years are we going to have to do this kind of labor for nothing? I suppose this board can only pledge that we will do the best job we possibly can. We all know that we're in tough financial times. Um, but in point of fact, we thank you for bringing your concerns to us. You are a member of the family, and we need your input, we need your advice. California law requires that no more than 25% of college courses be taught by part-time faculty members. The law was passed in 1989 in the belief that full-time instructors have more of a commitment to their colleges than part-timers. But money to hire full-time teachers is in short supply and some districts outside of Los Angeles have not complied with the law. The college district's chancellor, Donald Phelps, says there are advantages to using part-timers. They save the district money and offer flexibility. Phelps says he sympathizes with part-timers' gripes, but he offers little hope for change. I'm given a limited number or a finite number of dollars by the state uh, to operate uh, the institution, and the demand for services uh, is greater than the number of dollars provided by the state, so you turn to the part-time faculty. Many part-time faculty members, freeway flyers like Versace, say they often feel alienated from campus life. I know no one, aside from the department chairperson and maybe one or two teachers that I've happened to come in contact with over the years, because literally I go there and then I leave. It's mid-afternoon and Versace is on the campus of Santa Monica City College, where he teaches two freshman composition classes. He says he's tried without success to get one full-time teaching job. I've been at this uh, for six years now, and with my past experience, 20 years in high school, plus my degrees, um, I thought that I would have, quote, no trouble uh, getting full-time employment in junior college, but I haven't. Yeah, I've applied all over the place, more than once. There's a hundred to one applicants, a hundred applicants to one position uh, for an opening as a full-time teacher. I think that uh, three degrees, a BA from Princeton, an MAT from Harvard, an MA from Berkeley, 20 years experience at the uh, high school level. Should count for something. Should count for something. Okay. Bye-bye, baby. Bye-bye. It's 5.30 p.m and time for Versace to start the one-hour drive to Pasadena City College, his third campus. And as you can imagine, traffic very, very heavy all the way back from uh, 
up the Long Beach Freeway. Jill, let's give you. Do you resent having to drive around yeah. L.A. so much yeah, to make sure a living? Do. Sure, do. Really, when I'm going through downtown or change at night, I'm on my way to Pasadena for a two-hour class, and it's an hour, an hour and a half driving. I'm driving as much as I'm teaching that particular night. So it hardly, hardly seems worthwhile, and it hardly seems fair. Versace does some last-minute correcting of students' papers and then heads to a two-hour class. It's now 7 p.m. If it was just a matter of economic bottom line, get the labor as cheaply as you can, then I'd say, you know, bravo, you're doing a good job. But you're talking here about a lot of well-qualified people who happen to be hired in this uh, arbitrary category called part-time hourly instructor who's... Uh, I think lives have been, uh, you know, negatively affected. Their families and their futures are negatively affected by this year after year of part-time employment. It would be fine if he had an office because, like, me, I just come two days. And then you'll start uh, the assignment number five. And then sometimes there's, like, a time that I don't, I don't understand something. And it's like, I've been wanting to go to school, but he's not there. He's somewhere else in another school teaching. Paragraphs and sentences. Uh, okay, the introductory thesis paragraph starts off with the attention getter, the statement of significance, which is a question to your... Money, or more precisely, the lack of money, explains a lot of what's going on in colleges and universities today. The rising cost of a college education is keeping larger and larger numbers of the poor out. Your data on incoming freshmen indicate that family income is rising, but that's apparently not a good thing. Well, the problem is if the family income of the students is rising, it's telling you that you're becoming more elite as a system. That is, you're excluding more and more of the people of the society who are, uh, who are less uh, affluent. And so that's just another sign that we're not serving the real needs of the society like uh, we used to. We're going the wrong direction is the problem. Most of those who do go to college need outside help paying the bill. At least 30% of students go into debt. I will probably owe between $34,000 and $50,000. What I'm looking at now will be about $7,000. I, I owe the government quite a bit. <laughs> the financial aid office says I owe something like $6,000, and I think they're wrong. I think it's more like ten or 11000 Somewhere between eight eight and 10000 Why these huge debts? For one thing, over the last 10 years, the cost of going to college has gone up twice as much as family income. At the same time, government aid to students has changed from grants to loans. Part of the generational burden shifting that we've done in this country is make our kids pay for the national debt, uh, for our social security, and now we're, now we're sort of saying, by the way, we're going to stick you with a bill for going to college. I'll probably end up owing about 20000 by the time I'm done with grad school. I'll owe about $10,000. I think I owe about 12000 That's probably minimum. Paying for college has become a, a nightmare because uh, there isn't any one or two sources where you can go to get your college paid for. You go to 15 different sources. Even the government has too many programs. The states have several programs. The colleges have their own programs. Uh, then there are private philanthropists who have programs. It's crazy. I think I owe them a couple thousand dollars, like maybe two or three. I'll probably owe about $24,000 in loans. I'll owe approximately $12,000 when I graduate. The present system is unacceptable, not only for students, but for the taxpayers as well. It's complicated and it's expensive. It costs the taxpayers of our country about four billion dollars every year to finance the student loan program because of loan defaults and the cost of administering the program. But taxpayers are not the only ones who lose. Borrowing can have unforeseen consequences for students as well. It can force that young person into artificial career choices. Not choices that she or he wanted, but choices that will produce the wherewithal to repay the loans. The plan to simplify the biggest federal loan program will make it easier and slightly cheaper for students to borrow, but they'll still have to borrow. I think I'll owe about $3,000, three to $4,000. After undergrad, I'd probably owe around 20000 $20, or so. I guess I'll owe somewhere around $8,000 when I graduate, between eight and $10,000. President Clinton also wants to allow students to pay back their loans by working in their communities. 
We'll ask young people to work <clears throat> to help control pollution and recycle waste, to paint darkened buildings and clean up neighborhoods, <laughs> to work with senior citizens and combat homelessness and help children in trouble get out of it and build a better life. How many of you would, would sign up for a national service plan that helped you pay any co your college tuition but also required you to go teach in a place where it's hard to get teachers or do some kind of work? How many of you would do that? Yay. Pretty close to 100%. But the program would not start until 1994-95 and would only cover 25,000 volunteers. Remember, 13 million men and women are now in college. I've been going over your research, and what we know is that um, there's a decline among students in attending cultural events, playing musical instruments, reading, going to religious services, studying, working in campaigns, discussing religion, discussing politics, acting in plays, writing original poetry and fiction. All those things are going down. What's going on? What are students doing? They're watching more television. Uh, they do less homework, they're less involved, they do poorer, they drop out more often, they develop more materialistic values, uh, they uh, become more pessimistic about their lives, about society, about their control over their own lives. Um, it's uh, it's not, not a pretty picture. Happily, the news is not all bad. At Aston's own UCLA, thousands of students are volunteering at more than 40 community service programs. UCLA is not alone. At least 300 colleges have large and growing community service programs. Four times four. Eight. No, that's four plus four. What's four times four? Eight. Mm -mm. Four times four. Oh, 16. Good. One of the things about this course that we really... Some UCLA classes give students academic credit for their community service. Rachel Parker let her sociology class choose between writing a final paper or volunteering two hours each week. 38 of the 44 students chose community service. I tutor for the Migos Del Barrio program. It's in central LA and it's about 80% Hispanic children. And I realized I came from a very sheltered suburban area. Always I thought affirmative action was wrong, never believed in it because I thought it hurt um, other people who were, who were better able to go to college. And, now I'm actually getting learning hands-on how these people, how less of a chance they have than people come from a suburban area, how unfortunate they are. And while I'm helping them, tutoring them, teaching them first and second graders arithmetic, I'm actually learning more about the world, not just by reading and hearing, oh, these people have such a hard life. I'm seeing it. Let me give you a, a negative view, all right? And then we'll get you two to respond. This is just sort of touchy-feely, elitist, um, sheltered, suburban, well-to-do, feel better about yourselves, but you're not really helping anybody. I think that we can make a really big impact, and I think it's because of the extra time and attention. So many of these people normally just kind of go day to day and nobody pays any attention to them. And I think like when we come and say, and actually go through these things with them and say, hey, this is how you do it, you know, it makes such an impact. What's a riding vehicle that has only one wheel? A unicycle. Do you think you're, having a, you're doing any good with these kids? Yeah, I do. I mean, I see it when I teach them, when I take two or three children out of the classroom who are completely confused about something, and I teach them and they improve when I help them with their math or something. I mean, and also I show them someone who has gone to college and how they can go to college because they don't really have much of an idea. They don't have very many role models. What about the, the argument that this isn't really college? I mean, there's, this is no substance. You're supposed to be studying when you've got it. What do your parents say? Hey, hey, Dad, hey, Mom, guess what? Your tuition is going, I go out in the street. I think it's definitely college, because if we were to take this class without doing the community service, we'd be learning what the class models are, what the social movements have been, and I would be learning about it out of a book, but I chose to learn about it hands-on. Are you done with this one? Is that better? Yeah, I think it's better, because you, if you're doing it yourself, you're getting more out of it. Whereas if you were to read a book, you could skim it, but when you're doing it, you have to pay attention. <laughs> It's not replacing books at all. It's more of just like another additional aspect 
to supplement the works. Even five years ago, I, I'm a senior right now, um, about three years ago, I, I never seen enthusiasm like this before. Involvement in the community was basically books, books, books. Or me, me, me. Or me, 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 yeah. Is that passing, that notion that you're the me generation? Well, the 80s was traditionally known as the me generation, where the young people were making tons of money, and it was just money, money, money. And now I think it's like the 90s, where it's more like the we generation. What is your definition of real college? Your generation of real college may be from our, our definition of real college. You know, we want, we want more experience. We want to know what's out there. We want to break down this kind of ignorant trend we have in this society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think more than optimism is a feeling of determination because of because of the um, the uprising in LA that we've seen. We feel I think a lot of people feel like we're forced to do something now. We have to do something. We don't have a choice. It's not some sort of thing like oh we we we're so optimistic about the world we can change it. It's more of a feeling of like we have to do something. There's things wrong here. I think we feel a great amount of responsibility even in this class where we have the option. It's an option to do community service, and a lot of us have opted to do it. It involves a lot of our time. There's another way out. We can you know, write a paper, but it was our choice because, and for some of us it isn't a choice, for some of us it's purely responsibility to do community service. And I think, I think that's growing among young people. I think, I think um, classes like this teach us that. I think um, other things we're learning in our schools teach us this responsibility, and I think that's really important. A college education brings economic rewards, on average at least an extra half a million dollars in lifetime earnings. For those who want to go to college, how do they go about choosing? Here's a suggestion from Alexander Aston. The number one thing is go talk to some students. <laughs> Ask them what's going on, what they think of the place. That's the best information. Far better than a catalog or talking to a faculty member. Talk to some students. <laughs> go there and just buttonhole some students. Say, what's this place like? What happens to you here? How much priority does your learning have? Uh, and you'll get some pretty good information that way. Aston would not use popular rating systems because he says they rely on measures that are superficial. Number of full professors, faculty salaries, size of endowment, Nobel Prize winners, and so forth. Aston says judge colleges on what he calls talent development. In the final analysis, these are supposed to be educational institutions, and their excellence ought to be judged in terms of how effectively they educate their students. That means you've got to look at how the student actually changes during college, what they learn, how they change as individuals and as people. How do today's students evaluate their college experience? It's definitely worth it. I do sometimes wonder why I'm paying $25,000 a year, but money is money and I'll figure out how to pay it all off later. A big part of going to college is uh, the, the experience you gain from making friends and getting along with people. It is very expensive, but in the long run, you'll get a, a lot better job, and, and it pays off. I mean, education is always worth it. You can't look at, I don't think you can look at education just like learning books. I think your entire life is an education. It's just an experience that you're going to have to um, take for what it's worth. If you think about how much it's going to cost you, you're never going to enjoy it. When you look at the long run, and you see that with a college education, you can definitely get a higher paying job than without it. I think it makes up for it. I, I think that it, you know, it ought to be a sacrifice if people want to do it. It has been a wonderful experience for me, and I can't imagine going right out into the world after high school and being able to survive. I think besides an education, um, you also grow as a person. I think that's very important. I think it's definitely worth it to go, not just for the academic reasons, but also for emotional and just an experience that I think everyone should have. It's four years of your life and you should be really trying to make a good investment. You can bet that colleges and universities will do everything they can to make sure you remember that unforgettable experience. In fact, they'll sell you anything and everything emblazoned with the college name and mascot. How about the Montana State University Bobcat, complete with snow and, of course, the fight song. College marketing is a relatively new phenomenon. It began in the early 70s with Ohio State and UCLA leading the way. Now it's a $2 billion a year business. Colleges get $160 million, that's 8%. Uh, most of it goes to the athletic department, but then most of it is athletic stuff. T-shirts are a big seller. UCLA has 48 different T-shirts. The biggest seller, however, is Notre Dame. Lots of sweatshirts, beautiful sweatshirts. You can play tennis in your Syracuse sweater. Afterwards, put on your Wyoming jacket, and when all the clothes get dirty, 
put them in your University of Louisville laundry bag. Turns out you can outfit just about every room in the house. You can bring in the drinks on an Ole Miss tray and put them on Ole Miss coasters with Syracuse napkins. Put out your cigarettes, if you're still smoking, in your Ohio State ashtray. In fact, bring the entire Ohio State campus into your living room with this replica. Serve the chips and dip, courtesy of this UCLA football helmet. Read by your University of Louisville light. You can even sleep on a University of Louisville pillowcase. Why not sit on a chair from University of Louisville? Or I guess you can sit here. In the kitchen, food, coffee from Penn State, gummy Nittany Lions from Penn State, a barbecue tailgating kit, all kinds of sauces, chocolate from Syracuse. Now let's go outside and play. Play with your Syracuse football. Basketball with the University of Louisville. Golf. Protect the clubs, thanks to the University of Wyoming, and hit that Syracuse orange golf ball. Your license plate ought to advertise your college, USC. Stick this guy on your windshield, why not? Or play Frisbee, thanks to Stanford. This one comes with directions. Note, this side up. Find out which way the wind is blowing, thanks to the University of Wyoming. And back indoors, play UMassopoly, thanks to the University of Massachusetts. In short, you can do everything and anything. You'll never forget your college. You know what has not changed about college? Graduation and the speech. Here for you, Learning Matters presents the all-purpose graduation speech. Thank you. The graduating class of 1993. Thank you for making me a part of your graduation ceremony. I first of all would like to thank the class of 1993 for giving me the honor of being your representative this morning. I can't tell you how happy I am to receive an honorary degree today. I don't know if I deserve it, but I want it. To all of the graduates, your parents, and I, and provided a perfect world. Don't screw it up. <laughs> My message to you today is that we, the older generation, have given you a perfect world, so don't screw it up. This morning, I hope to share with you my feelings of where we have been and where we are going. In your quest for a successful life, you must determine how to balance dreams with reality or more to the point, ascertain the difference between dreams and vision, aspiration and reality. Is it best time to say, what will I do with my life? How can I be successful? And more importantly, what is success? We need to take a collective deep breath. There are no greater individuals that have lived, that live now. And you are a part of a remarkable generation. Your first challenge will now be to evaluate short-term opportunities with long-term goals. I'm a firm believer that if you have a dream that wakes you up in the morning and moves you through your day, it would be unfair for you not to go after that dream. But do not ever let others define you. Do not ever let others limit you. But don't let the harsh realities of life douse your fires of imagination. Young people can change the world. And by throwing yourself over and over again into the tumult of the world with the intensity of making your voice count, only thus will you really become the precise person that you are to be in life. My final message to you today. So as you leave here, make your voice heard. Embrace the challenges and don't lose heart when the buzzer sounds. Fight, fight, and fight again. If you hold fast to your dreams, you can be whatever you want to be. Congratulations to you. Good luck. This is your day. A twilight day and a magical day. I bid you goodwill, good luck, and Godspeed. 
Thank you and Godspeed. I congratulate every one of you. Donate. Now I am finished. Remember the cliche, the ivory tower? The idea that colleges and universities are not part of the real world? You can forget that. Colleges and universities have all the problems of the real world and more. You've seen some of the problems and some solutions in this program. American colleges and universities have a remarkable degree of autonomy. Nobody tells them whom to admit, whom to hire, what to teach, or how to teach it. They also have the power to reform themselves, to focus more of their energy on teaching and learning. The question is, will they? For Learning Matters, I'm John Merrill. To find out more about this program, visit us at PBS Online at the Internet address on your screen. Matters is made possible by grants from the people of Toyota, who believe that striving for excellence is not just a goal, but a way of life. Learning Matters is also made possible by grants from the Pew Charitable Trusts, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.